Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Omar Figueroa, and Andrew Kingsale is here with us. We will wait one minute uh, for everybody to show up and start promptly at 9.01. This webinar is being recorded as well as live streamed on YouTube for posterity. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Omar Figueroa, and Andrew Kingsale is here with us. We Okay, I think it's 9.01, Omar. Um, so why don't we get started? Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Andrew Kingsdale, and I'm a lawyer with the law offices of Omar Figueroa. And this is a presentation on strategies for the New York cannabis market. Uh, so before we kick off, uh, we're just gonna give our standard uh, presentation disclaimer here. Um, Nothing in this webinar should be construed as legal advice uh, or as an offer to perform legal services. Uh, and since all good legal advice is fact specific, audience members should uh, not act or refrain from acting on the basis of any information that's included herein uh, without seeking appropriate legal advice on their particular facts and circumstances. Um, and uh, this presentation does not create any attorney client relationship. So I'm joined today uh, by Omar Figueroa. Hello, Omar. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Omar has been a leader in the cannabis industry for over 20 years. Among other accomplishments, he's the director of the he is a director of the National Cannabis Industry Association, the California Cannabis Tourism Association, and the Sebastopol Center for the Arts. He is also a chapter leader of the Sonoma County ACLU. He's a founding lifetime member and former director of the International Cannabis Bar Association, a lifetime member of the Normal Legal Committee, and has been recognized with the rare Distinguished Counsel's Award by Normal. And uh, he's also compiled uh, two series of books, one on California cannabis laws, and the other, which was just released last year, on New York's cannabis laws. He's uh, officially deputized to jump in and, and uh, provide any of his insights during this presentation. And, uh, and if anybody has any questions during the presentation, uh, please feel free to put them into the chat and, and Omar, maybe you can help bring them to my attention if I, if I don't see them uh, in time. Great. And there I am. And so Andrew joined our firm in 2018. He has over 10 years of litigation and transactional experience. He's passionate about the medical benefits of cannabinoids and helping cannabis, hemp, and psychedelics businesses thrive. He's an active member of the New York State Bar Association Cannabis Law Section, as well as the New York City and Hudson Valley Cannabis Industry Associations. Um, he's also like the chair of the, what is it, hemp and cannabinoid CBD and hemp cannabinoid products. Uh, that's right. Uh, committee within the uh, cannabis law section of the New York State Law Bar Association. And he's um, has been selected to Northern California Super Lawyers for 2021, also 2022. And before that, he was a rising star for many years. Uh, he graduated from Dartmouth College with a focus on Asian studies. After working in China for five years, he earned his law degree with honors from Temple University, and he's licensed to practice in New York, California, and Massachusetts. Thank you for that introduction, Omar. Yeah, and uh, you know, I'll just add that I am originally from New York, uh, but I moved to California shortly after law school. So I've been serving primarily uh, California cannabis clients uh, until recently. And, and about four years ago, I had the good fortune of meet, meeting Omar. And with the passage of the MRTA, that's New York's Marijuana Regulation and Taxation Act last year, uh, we've just been super excited to bring our knowledge of this industry to New York. Um, you know, with regard to cannabis, California and New York are, are, are really actually have a lot of similarities, I think. They both have these rich cannabis histories, strong legacy operators, 
uh, and huge markets with lots of visitors uh, in them. Uh, but in this presentation, uh, what we really wanted to highlight is that there are some differences, and I think you'll find it in a good way uh, between New York and California. So, for example, some of you who um, you know are, are familiar with us and, and the California cannabis laws will probably be glad to hear that uh, there's going to be no stacking of licenses in, in New York, L little to none, uh, which is going to be great for the, for the smaller legacy operators. Um, there's going to be no burdensome cultivation tax, which has been a real thorn in the side of a lot of California uh, businesses. Um, there's an emphasis on promoting equity and social and economic equi equity uh, right up front uh, at the state level. So you don't have a patchwork of regulations. Um, and uh, most jurisdictions actually cannot ban outright most of the license types. There's some that they can, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. But I think that's another huge improvement. Um, and then of course you have on-site consumption <laughs> lunches and, and bars, which, which is gonna be uh, a, a very, really uh, great um, addition. So we're looking forward to digging into some of these issues with you. Um, and hopefully help you make some better decisions as you decide, decide to join the uh, New York cannabis, cannabis market. So uh, let's jump right into it. And here's our agenda. Uh, there's going to be pretty heavy emphasis uh, on applying for uh, on the licensing process and, and application strategies up front. But we're also going to touch on some of the some other issues, other ways that you might might get involved in the New York market. So for example, buying or investing in an existing licensed business or a registered organization. Uh, we have licensing intellectual property to, li to uh, licensed cannabis businesses, selling services to licensed businesses, selling or distributing cannabis cannabinoid hemp products uh, and cannabis tourism. And then finally, we'll uh, add end with some uh, Q and A. But first, let's talk about some background on New York's cannabis laws. I think it's important to uh, really understand how uh, how we got here and why the MRTA uh, is such a watershed moment for New York. On the left, there is New York Governor Nelson Rockefeller who is uh, impetus behind the infamous Rockefeller drug laws, which passed in 1973 and increased penalties for selling cannabis and possessing cannabis to a minimum prison sentence of 15 years. Really truly draconian and um, the impacts of these Rockefeller laws and, and similar New York policies uh, have, has been ongoing and, and really disproportionate. I'm going to read you a couple of statistics. In 2010, New York's cannabis-related arrest rate was the highest of any state, and it was double the national average. Statistics also show that nationwide, Black people are nearly four times more likely than white people to be arrested for cannabis possession. And indeed, in 2020, people of color made up 94% of cannabis related arrests by the New York Police Department. That's in 2020. So um, on the right there, I gave a photo of, New of Omar's book uh, be in part because it has an excellent summary of New York's laws uh, and these issues uh, and their impacts in the preface of the book. There it is, all right. <laughs> Thank you, Omar. Well, the tide has begun to turn uh, and to right these wrongs. And in 2019, with decriminalization, there was a, a decriminalization legislation uh, that included automatic expungement of certain crimes. And about two, over 200,000 records have been automatically expunged so far. And then came an MRTA, uh, signed into law March 31st last year. And under that, a whole host of additional uh, convictions are eligible for automatic expungement. And it's estimated that 
over 250,000 more convictions, conviction records will be expunged by March of 2023. Andrew, are these automatic expungements or do people need to go to court for those? Well, if, they're, if they fit this, um, basically if they're for crimes that were now, are now legal under uh, uh, the MRTA, so possessing uh, 16 ounces or selling up to 25 grams, those are eligible for automatic expungement. If they're greater than that, then there are other options for uh, seeking to um, have them um, d- decreased, basically. Um, but uh, it's not automatic. Okay. Yep. So I just want to give this context for um, partly uh, to show why equity is such a focus of the MRTA, um, and as we'll see. Um, really integral to the regulated market. Uh, so here's a chart that uh, summarizes some of, some of the developments in the regulated market. So New York started off like many states with a medical cannabis program with the Compassionate Care Act in 2014. And that has since been updated with MRTA uh, in 2020. And in fact, just uh, uh, recently, the draft medical uh, cannabis regulations came out. So um, that the, the law is, has been basically bringing that program under, uh, under the MRTA, as you'll see all, all of the ca- uh, cannabis markets have. Um, so the, the, similarly with the cannabinoid hemp program, uh, retail and distributor license uh, formed, uh, started uh, in, with this law in 2020. And then the MRTA, brings that program uh, under its purview. Um, And finally, um, with the adult use program, that is is what's new, brand new in the MRTA. Um, But the regulations aren't out yet. And so um, that's something to keep in mind. You know, we know a lot based on what the statute is, based on the draft medical regs, we have cannabinoid hemp regs, regulations, but um, we don't have the adult use cannabis regulation. So that's something they really keep an eye out um, and uh, it'll, be, it'll be closely watched and, and comment on it when it comes out. Because if you're interested in getting into this, into this market, uh, you'll have an opportunity to shape the regulations or at least have a say um, while they're still in the works. And Andrew, didn't the medical cannabis program kind of get expanded by allowing doctors to recommend for any medical condition? Yes. Absolutely, absolutely, and that's uh, something I'm going to cover. They, they, that, but that's a great point. Is that that's one of the changes in the M, under the MRTA is that there used to be a prescribed list of conditions, medical conditions that uh, somebody had to qualify for to, in order to become a quali- uh, certified patient. Now it's really up to the practitioner's uh, discretion if they feel that uh, cannabis can help the patient uh, for whatever that that ailment may be. Then they, then they may prescribe uh, cannabis. That's a great, great development. Um, so in this slide, I'm just wanted to lay out some, some of the terms that uh, we're gonna be using today so that everybody's on the same page. Uh, you have the, the Cannabis Control Board or CCB, I'll probably call it most often, which oversees the development of the regulations and the issuance and the transfers uh, 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 of licenses. The OCM is the Office of Cannabis Management. So that's overseen by the CCB and it really implements the licensing, uh, the inspections, the enforcement programs. Uh, so it's implementing that. The chief equity officer is um, de- responsible for developing and implementing a, an, a social and equi- economic equity plan under the MRTA. And then there's a state Cannabis Advisory Board, which con- will consist of a, a diverse group of p- people who will advise the CCB on, on various aspects uh, of the canna- cannabis and, and hemp pr- industries. The next one there is social and economic equity applicants. So this you see a lot in the MRTA and you'll see a lot in the regulations. Um, and here's why. The goal shall be established to award 50% of adult cannabis licenses to social and economic equity applicants. So that's the goal. Um, and there's a lot more in the, uh, in the actual statute to 
explain how that how it will be carried out. But here I wanted to just highlight what, what does it mean to be a, a social and economic equity applicant? How do you qualify that for that? And here are the um, here are the, the categories of people who um, might might qualify for that. Um, but it's also important to realize uh, in, in service disabled veter veterans as well. So if you're a business, how do you qualify for that? Well, it's spelled out uh, that in, in the statute so that if you're a business to be, say, if you want to be a, a, a minority owned business that qualifies for uh, one of these social and economic equity applicant status, the um, one or more minority group members has to own at least 51% of the company. They have to have, quote, real substantial and continuing ownership of the company. And those owners, quote, must have and exercise authority to control independently the day-to-day -day business decisions of the enterprise. So it's not just ownership, it's also ownership and control. And that's one thing that I think uh, we should keep in mind when we're talking about you know, uh, applying for licenses and buying licenses, investing in licenses um, to be able to preserve that status. And now, finally, oh, Andrew, can I ask you about distressed farmers? So that is, that's open to anybody of any gender, ethnicity? It is. And it's based on, um, you know, it's, it's a kind of a complicated de definition. Mm -hmm. uh, has to do with some tax filings. You have to be able to show essentially that you know your your income level has been below a certain certain amount uh, mm -hmm. for I think it's two years um, is a way to, is a way to qualify for that. And then registered organizations are um, they are the medical pro they're under the purview of the medical program. So instead of being called a, a licensee, adult use cannabis businesses are licensees. For medical programs, what you do is you register an organization, um, and we'll get into some of that as well as we start talking about applying for licenses. Maybe uh, before we go to that, why don't we take our first poll? Oh, so yeah. Planning on a license. Great. All right. So uh, if, if everybody can start answering the poll, I think, can you see? I'll, I'll launch the poll. All right. And if you could take a, a minute to answer. And so basically the question is, are you planning to apply for a New York cannabis license? And the options are definitely, probably, maybe, or just looking. And I think we have, uh, yeah, 80% participation and, you know, there's some, there's a whole gamut of interests. Some people are just looking, some are maybe, one is probably, and, and four out of the nine are definitely, so. And we should clarify, you know, that, that the, the cannabis license applications are not out yet uh, for, for adult use licenses and for, uh, and for the new, to be a new registered organization. Uh, I, I meant to, to mention that there are, 10 registered organizations in New York currently uh, that were formed under, founded under the Compassionate Care Act, uh, but that uh, will expand in, um, under the, under, once the MRTA, once the new regulations come out, um, there will be new, new applications. Wow, great, four out of nine, definitely applying, okay. Was there another poll that you wanted to? Oh yeah, yeah. The other one is experience in cannabis. I guess we'll launch this poll. Uh, so the question is, how many years of experience do you have in the cannabis industry? And the uh, range of options is just looking, less than one year, one to two years, three to four years, five or more years, ten or more years, twenty or more years. I think you might be the only one qualifying for twenty or four more years. I, I didn't answer. Somebody has twenty or more years. It's amazing. <laughs> Oh, this is fantastic. I, I like it when the answers are everywhere. Um, so we seem to have like a cannabis experience. Nobody's just looking. All right, so let me um, post a poll. There's the poll results for everybody. Very cool. 
Very cool. All right. So now let, let's get to uh, back. All right. All right. Thanks. So as we'll see later on in this presentation, a major strategy or consider, consideration, I guess, when, when uh, applying for a license is which license type are you going to choose? Um, and we'll go over the list, but I just want to ha highlight some of the factors at issue here. So um, whether or not you're applying as a social and economic equity applicant actually has a, a, a pretty important role because um, as you've seen with the 50% goal, um, they, they, are, uh, they, they are given some preference. And in fact, certain license types explicitly say that they sh the granting of those licenses shall promote social and economic equity applicants. Um, and there's, uh, as I'll describe later, there's a public private fund for, uh, of $200 million for social and economic equity applicants who may, may want to apply for a, a, a retail license. There's incubator programs. There, there may be other loans available. So there are a lot of benefits to being a, a qualifying as a social and economic equity applicant. Cross ownership restrictions. That's whether or not you can own multiple licenses and or own licenses across license types. As we'll see, um, that is a big consideration, especially if you're planning, if you have plans to expand beyond just one, one license, or if your goal is to vertically be vertically integrated. Uh, license transferability, uh, another big one if, uh, you know, uh, looking at ex exit strategies or, or acquisition opportunities, things that you, you want to keep in mind. Site control requirements. Do you need to own or possess the premises of, at the time of the application? Um, as we'll see, you, there's a good chance that you may, especially for certain license types like retail and on-site consumption licenses. And that carries some risks with it because um, often you'll find in this industry that landlords will charge a premium uh, to cannabis. Uh, company um, tenants. Location requirements. Uh, the MRTA has a requirement you cannot be within 500 feet of a school grounds or 200 feet of a house of worship. So that's something to consider when looking into where, where to um, site your premises. Uh, local jurisdiction control. Um, so as probably everybody here knows, um, if you're interested in retail or on-site consumption, license, you need to know if your local jurisdiction opted out. And that was that had to be done by December 31st uh, last year. But it's also important to realize that even if your local jurisdiction did not opt out, they still have the ability to implement what's called time, place, or manner restrictions on your business. So like green zones or hours of operation, all of these things that you really want to uh, have a good handle on. Um, before you start applying. And finally, there are taxation responsibilities. And as we'll find out, um, those fall for the cannabis taxes, primarily on the distributors and the retailers. Oh, I'm sorry, there's one more there, which is pricing restrictions. Um, and that's, uh, sorry, that's relevant to uh, registered organizations because under the statute, um, the CCB is authorized to modify the price per dose of any medical cannabis product, if necessary, to maintain public access to appropriate medication. Wow. Speaking of medical, let's talk about uh, new registered organizations. So beyond the 10 that are already existing. Registered organizations uh, are can be vertically integrated. They're one of the few, aside from micro businesses and um, and one other type that we'll talk about that um, can do it all. Um, but I think it's important to be eyes wide open on this. Um, it, it's really, they're considered healthcare providers uh, under the public health law. And, and in a lot of ways, they're, they're functioning as, as that. So um, like, unlike in California, um, any time that uh, a medical cannabis is dispensed, they have need safety inserts that describe the products. And um, they have to have a, a pharmacist supervising them. Um, and, and as I had mentioned previously, their pricing it, it, it can be regulated. So um, 
there's that. There's also an opportunity here. I mean, if you are um, a, a social and economic equity applicant, there's going to be a real emphasis on that when when the when the CCB and OCM issue make licenses available and are evaluating licenses. Um, they really want to diversify the uh, the medical cannabis field, especially because some of the ten existing ROs they're big multi-state operators, maybe not as um, you know, locally focused um, or diverse as, as the MRTA aspires to. And here are the adult use license types. So on the left-hand side there, you'll see the nine that are most frequently cited. Uh, the green line is, um, will become more apparent why it's there, but it has a lot to do with cross ownership restrictions. Um, but I also wanted to mention some of these on the right side, which are some of the permits in the MRTA that are sometimes overlooked, uh, but super important, uh, like testing laboratories. So uh, um, everybody, uh, medical, adult use, hemp cannabinoid businesses, all going to need to use testing laboratories. Um, they have very strict cross ownership restrictions, but, um, but they're, 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 that's certainly a big part of it. Cannabis research licenses. We need our researchers. So don't forget, you can apply for a research license and, and really and study it, um, uh, which we hope we hope we do. These special use permits are mentioned in the MRTA, and there, there's not a lot of detail about them. They seem to be temporary permits uh, that are maybe for 90 days, uh, but they if you have a um, a particular need, uh, I think there's going to, there would be fleshed out a lot more in the adult use regs, but um, industrial use permit is say, if you want uh, to buy some cannabis for uh, things like apparel or energy or paper tools or scientific products or um, any other industri industrial use. Um, trucking permits will allow for trucking or transportation of cannabis products. Um, to, by a person other than a, than a licensee. Warehouse will allow for the storage of cannabis and cannabis products um, and packaging permit. Sort of says what it, what it does. And so we'll find out how, how useful they may be. They may be just supplementary permits for existing licensees or people who are trying to get in can get a foot in the door uh, with one of these special permits. Uh, and finally, there's what, what I call uh, registered organizations with adult use privileges, and, and they, have, they have much longer names, but essentially the, the 10 existing registered organizations are now granted four additional stores, locations uh, for, for their businesses adult, where, in which they can use, sell adult, adult use. And so here I wanted to highlight to some of some of the selection criteria uh, that are in the MRTA in terms of their uh, adult use licenses. So for example, this first one really has to do with what I was talking about site control. Um, and it's a general requirement that the applicant possess or have the right to use sufficient land, buildings, equipment, uh, as described in the application, or, and here's in the benefit if you're a social and economic equity applicant, you just need a plan to do so. Uh, similarly, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a benefit there if you are a social and economic equity applicant. If not, you need um, a plan to benefit uh, people disproportionately impacted. And this last one relates to um, proximity to other to other stores, so uh, they are um, going to be conscious of having too much concentration uh, in one in one area geographically. All right, so let's start talking about some of the specific licenses. Um, dig into each of the nine, and then um, try to give some um, summarize uh, so, some of the takeaways at the end. Adult use cultivation licenses. These allow for growing, cloning, harvesting, drying, curing, grading, and trimming. 
it's important to know that there are, uh, as of uh, end of last month, I think it was, they passed S8084A, which gives hemp growers a head start because they now have, are eligible for conditional licenses if they meet specific conditions. But um, these, are the, uh, these are what they'll be able to do under their conditional licenses. Uh, they're, they're granted these temporary authorities. Um, so, um, the goal there, I should just mention, is that, that, that there's enough supply of product uh, when you know retail uh, stores come online. Um, but it's not without controversy because you know hemp growers sometimes don't don't necessarily qual meet the the diversity and equity uh, goals of the MRTA. So that's why um, McDaniels, board member uh, Ruben McDaniels mentioned on, on uh, a, a, pr a presentation that he gave recently that they're working on uh, finding ways for equity applicants to um, be have a leg up on the indoor cultivation when those licenses become available because the conditional licenses don't involve uh, indoor they're just uh, mixed light outdoor and mixed light um, but so the indoor cult if you're an indoor cultivate if you want to do indoor cultivation and you're uh, a social and economic equity applicant um, that there's a, there's likely to be a good opportunity there uh, on the cross ownership issue uh, you can only have one but potentially multiple locations under that one license and you can also have um, license a processor license, a distributor license, and a nursery license. We'll talk about that distributor license because it's, it's a little bit restrictive if you have multiple licenses there as to what you can do, but uh, something to keep in mind. And then finally, and this is sort of some speculation on my part, but uh, I think there may be, uh, so in the hemp cannabinoid regulations uh, recently revised to uh, add a craft designation. Um, and so that was for uh, small growers, growers of less than, uh, let's see, less than a, a thousand pounds of dried hemp annually um, mm -hmm. and who hand trim, hang dry, hand package products. So uh, I suspect there may be something similar in the adult use regs coming out. We'll have to see, but uh, perhaps an opportunity for some smaller farmers um, to to. And this would be an official craft designation. We don't have that in California. Like people mm -hmm. brand their product craft all the time. And, you know, for all you know, it's produced in a massive industrial facility. That's right. That's right. And, and in New York, they're going to have standards for it, which is, which is great, I think. Um, okay, so let me see here. Well, now we're on to nurseries. Check my time here. And, okay. Um, for nurseries, uh, this is what you're allowed to do. Um, and as with a cultivation license, you can have you know cross ownership between these, we'll just call them like producer uh, uh, licenses. Here's one where the, the statute does say that it's the granting of the license shall promote social and economic equity applicants. Um, processors. So this is what's been called manufacturing in California. Um, and here's what they are allowed to do. Again, like the cultivators, hemp processors have a head start. Uh, so um, there's that. And, 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 and again, I think that might trigger some additional equity requirements once full licensing uh, becomes available. There is a there is an equity um, mentorship program under the con conditional licenses. Um, so if you're if you qualify as an e equity social economic equity applicant uh, and you're interested in cultivation or, or processing, you might look into that mentorship program could could pro possibly provide a, a leg up. Um, and processing is, is similar to, to cultivating. So you get only one license, potentially multiple locations, and you can have all these other producer licenses. And, and importantly, you could apparently do it all on one premises. 
which is a which is a big benefit. Uh, and then finally, the um, processors are the ones who are going to be submitting the you know the products to the to the laboratories. Um, so uh, something to keep in mind. Um, and and I thought this was interesting that the CCB can actually tell you which laboratory you have to use, <laughs> essentially. Yeah. That's unprecedented in California. Now, yeah. uh, a question about these conditional licenses where the uh, hemp growers and processors get a head start. You know, what are strategies for entering via that way for somebody who's not already an existing hemp process processor? Like buy an ownership interest in an existing hemp processor? Well, the regulations haven't come out yet. The, the legislation just recently passed. So there's going to be regulations that, that come out specific to the conditional licenses. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, can you buy, there, there are uh, ownership transfer restrictions in, in the statute for these um, conditional license holders. So you'd want to, you can look into that. Um, but before they become a conditional license holder, is it possible to acquire maybe a existing hemp processor? Ah, uh, that's a good question. I don't know that answer yet. I don't think it's in the statute, but uh, um, it's, a, it's a something, some possibility, certainly. And I think we have a question from um, an attendee. When will the S8084A regulations drop? Any insight? Well, this is, uh, you can see the dates here for, say, for processing, and I think the same for cultivation. So I, if I get your question right, uh, they will have the right to process um, until uh, June 30th, 2024. No, I think um, the question is, when will the regulations be released? That's what well, she- Oh, the regulations. Oh, the regulations, when are they? Yeah, uh, I, I don't have any any insights on that yet. You know, everything's, everything seems to be taking um, a little longer than, than suspected, um, but which is something that you can keep an eye out and you can also, uh, go to the New York uh, Cannabis, uh, the OCM's website. I think it's newyork.cannabis.gov. And they, um, you can sign up for updates there to be able to be notified when that happens. All right. So let's talk about distributors. Um, distributors always sound like a good idea because, you know, it's, it's nice to be the middleman. But um, there are some big problems with it in California, and there are also some issues to consider in, uh, in New York as well. One uh, that I highlighted here, literally, uh, is that if you, are, are, if you have, a, say, a distributor license, um, and you also want to uh, be a cultivator or have a cultivator or processor license, you may do that, but the the, the limiting factor is that then you can only distribute your own products. Um, so that could really hamper your, um, at least your wholesale offerings. And so something, to, something to consider. The other big one is taxes. And this is pretty unique in, in New York. So New York has, uh, has an excise tax that's going to be paid at the, the retail level. But before then, there is this, um, it's a per milligram of total THC tax. So it kind of acts like alcohol and the way alcohol is taxed by proof. Um, but it's not really been done much in, in the cannabis industry. And, um, and some people say uh, it's going to be, well, let me just tell you what it is. So first, you have edibles taxed at three cents per milligram of total THC. And then there you can see concentrates. Uh, I guess it's 0.08 cents uh, per, per milligram, and then cannabis flower, 0.05 uh, per milligram there. And so you're really going to have to do some kind of careful tracking uh, of, of, um, of, your, of the various products that you have. And this burden falls on the distributor to pay these taxes to the state. Um, you know, some say it, it's going to be super complicated. Uh, you're going to have a lot of compliance costs. Uh, to be honest, we, as we've seen in Omar with the cultivation tax and what a headache that is when it has to get passed on 
between from the cultivator to the manufacturer to the distributor and it gets super complicated. I almost think that this scheme is, is, is a little bit, uh, it's not that bad, maybe. No, no, I, I don't think so. I, I would, you know, get rid of focusing on THC because, um, you know, the, the, it's, um, I don't know, I, I, don't, I, don't, I, I guess it, it discourages people from getting high potency products, but when you use high potency products, you use less of them and they're healthier in order to achieve the desired effect because there's less intake of the other components. And so I don't really understand like the public health reasons for like, you know, trying to make it more expensive to have a high THC products when in reality, like people will use less product to get the desired effect. Right. You know? right. And so it's almost like if, if you're trying to catch a bus and you got like this near beer like you have in utah like i remember going to zion national park after a long hike and i was like all right i just want to catch a bus you know i know if i drink <laughs> beer i'm golden and i'm drinking like six beers to get that desired effect yes yes exactly uh, and that's that's exactly the counter argument for why this sh is not going to work and it's totally possible that new york might reconsider this because it is you know unique and it's and it's gotten some blowback um i will say that um, you know, the, what I've heard is the, the thinking behind it was, um, like you said, it was, uh, Cuomo has this, had this quote uh, before it was signed where we said one of the goals of legalization was fostering and promoting temperance in consumption. Mm. Uh, so it's sort of like a, a Pigovian tax scheme where you're, you're trying to prevent people from over consuming. Uh, whether or not that's, that's actually going to happen, I, I don't I, I think I, I side with you on that. Well, I think the way to promote temperance and consumption is not to tax THC, but educate people about like terpenes and the other qualities of cannabis and say, this is where the value is. Just like with alcohol, like wine education has taken the wine consumer away from looking at like the proof of the wine, you know, the high potency fortified wine is better. That's not the case at all when it comes to like refined consumption of wine. People are like uh, consuming wine and imbibing for taste not yeah. just for alcohol content. Right. right. And I should plug Omar as a, as a Ganjier, one of the founding members of the Ganjier oh. Council. He knows, he knows what he's talking about when it comes to the- I spent a lot of time thinking about this with uh, the other Ganjier people. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. So I guess what I would just say is uh, in terms of strategies, I mean, assuming this tax stays on the books, I think what you wanna do is, you know, really make sure you have a New York specific inventory and tracking software system uh, because this is different. And, and you might also want to try to seek some reassurances from your testing lab uh, on those THC measurements, because if they're wrong, that burden is falling on the distributor to make sure that they're paying the taxes accurately. So you might want to, uh, you know, shift that burden a little bit to the testing lab. Well, yeah, you can enter into an agreement where they agree to indemnify you if the lab results are wrong because it's not your fault, it's the lab's fault. Yeah. Uh, but they may not be willing to do so if there's you know, only a limited number of labs and they have monopoly power. That's true. That's very true. Oh, okay, well, I think we had some strategies that you had at, at the end of the last slide that looks fantastic. Oh, yeah. Well, these slides will be available on our website, right, Omar, the, uh, mm -hmm. later on if anybody wants to... I think I covered those. Um, so I'm just in the interest of time. We're going to keep moving. Uh, on the retail, uh, you know, this is always a very popular license type, but it's, it's tend, it tends to be really capital intensive and, and tightly regulated. Um, so, and in New York, it has very restrictive cross ownership rules. So, you know, throughout the MRTA, they're saying, you know, if you have, you can have uh, three actually uh, dispensaries but you may not have any other interest in any of these other um, license types. So um, if you're a dispensary owner, that's, that's what you're doing. Um, and also the other big issue there is, uh, is the local, local jurisdictions. And, and so you, you really need to pay attention, choose carefully. Um, there are jurisdictions that have opted out. Uh, though for those that didn't opt out, the time, place, manner restrictions. And then there's this provision in the MRTA that for retail and on-site on consumption lounges, if you're applying for a license, you have to notify the local jurisdiction 
at least 30 days before you submit your, your license application, they get to then comment on your license application and that becomes part of your application process. So if you have some vocal, local NIMBYs, anti-cannabis people, uh, that could really throw, um, throw a wrench in, in, your, in your plans. Similarly, uh, as I mentioned before, there are site control requirements in terms of having to own, own the property. Uh, they say the applicant shall be the owner of the premises or be able to demonstrate possession of the premises within 30 days of final approval of the license uh, through a lease or a management or, or agreement. Something to keep in mind. Um, here's the $20 million public-private fund opportunity if you're uh, um, uh, social and economic equity applicant. Uh, so that's definitely one strategy to consider. Um, another one is uh, something that you, we, we've talked about, Omar, which is if you know there's a jurisdiction that doesn't have adult use licenses, say that's opted out, or you know, looking at you, Suffolk, Suffolk County, or, uh, or next to a state that doesn't have adult use, legalization mm -hmm. looking at you Pennsylvania uh, might be a good place to put your put your store because you're getting you're going to get a lot of traffic I and mean, we've seen that throughout the country where um, you know dry states have, have been next to states that open up and um, it's, it's a great great opportunity business-wise um, and then the only other thing I would just say you know regard to, to the um, local control issues is really start your public relations and community outreach early uh, and, and have a clear plan for how you're going to benefit the community. Um, we have a question from a pan, uh, attendee. Is that local approval common only for dispensary and on-site consumption or for all license type? Great only, question. Yes, great question. Only for dispensaries and on-site consumption. Yeah. So consumption lounges and dispensaries only. Yeah. So that's very different than California, where like in California... Uh, some municipalities are allowed to ban all types of uh, cannabis licenses. In New York, the only types that they can really ban are dispensaries and consumption lounges, and they can't really stop somebody from opening the businesses. But can they put in uh, reasonable time, place, manner restrictions? They have to be reasonable. Good point. They have to be reasonable. There is a, uh, you know, the way, way it's described in the MRTA is that you can't have such tight restrictions that it would make it like practically impossible. I forget what the exact term is, but practically impossible to set up one of your businesses there. Uh, I'm sure there are gonna be local jurisdictions that do, and there's gonna probably be some litigation that follows about that. But uh, yes, it has to be within reason. Definitely. All right, so on-site consumption, uh, like it says, uh, you know, you're to selling to consumers who consume on-site, like a bar, that actually is a quote from uh, Tr Tremaine Wright, the CCB, uh, chair of the CCB. That's what she said uh, during a presentation. I like that. Kind of simplifies it, makes it real clear. Um, again, just like the, dis the retail dispensaries, you have the same issues that we just talked about in terms of local control. Here's, an, here's one that's going to be unique to on-site consumption lounges. So New York, and this is... Again, not on the books, but I'm, I'm predicting something to look out for uh, and maybe part of the regs. So New York has this Dram Shop Act, and a lot of states do, uh, which in New York prohibits sales to any person actually or apparently under the underage and to any person visibly intoxicated. Uh, and so... Uh, under the law, the compensation uh, for injury caused by the illegal sale of, uh, of, into uh, of the intoxicating liquor, the, what that means, means to say is that the injured party uh, may, may be compensated and, and recover from the bar that sold the, the alcohol to that, to that person. And there's both actual and exemplary damages. So uh, it's pretty severe. And, and my prediction is that, you know, you're going to have, um, uh, uh, you know, these issues arise if you have a, an on-site consumption business, um, especially New York mentioned 
uh, they're, they're increasing their drug recognition expert training, DREs. I don't know if they have those in California, Omar, but these are yeah. police, police officers trained to use field testing techniques to classify ca uh, different categories of substance impairment. Well, they're supposedly increasing their tr that, that training. Um, and you can be sure they're going to be looking for cannabis impairment. Um, so some strategies there that I just mentioned, um, maybe hire somebody with bar experience, you know, hire a manager, somebody who's managed a bar before, probably a good mm -hmm. idea. Because what you really want to do is implement uh, a risk management strategy that incorporates, very importantly, insurance protections. So, you, you know, you want to work with an experienced insurance broker uh, and get some good liability insurance. And you should also have some clear written policies and procedures um, that will mitigate the risks um, and, and training and, you know, post warnings about potential impairment. Mm -hmm. uh, coordinate with ride sharing services. So, you know, consumers will, will refrain from driving. You know, these are there are strategies that you can implement to try to reduce this uh, potential liability, but it, it, it's going to be there. Yeah, an attendee uh, commented, I feel like police officers uh, sit outside these consumption lounges to see who's driving. And that's definitely a phenomenon also in the alcohol industry. I've had clients, DUI clients, who uh, went to a bar and the cops were sitting outside and pulling everybody over, you know, um, just so that they could mess with them. And it was almost like shooting fish in a barrel for them. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's going to be there. There's no doubt about it. All right. And then uh, let's see. My personal favorite delivery, uh, I think, is, is really cool. Uh, is that is, something that can be banned? No. In the local jurisdiction. Huh? No. Uh, so you can only have one license. But here, check this out. Each delivery license may have a total of no more than 25 individuals or the equivalent thereof providing full-time paid delivery services. So I think the intent here and probably what's gonna work is, is to um, really keep them, keep them within scale. You know, uh, I, I don't know if Ease is gonna be able to take off there, some, some other mega deliveries. And uh, so I think it's a great opportunity. As you know, New York has a rich delivery network, legacy delivery network already. Uh, there are no local opt-outs, uh, and this employee cap, I think, means there's going to be some robust competition throughout the state. Um, of course, there's going to be issues with, you got to own your vehicles, vehicle insurance, um, and, and so on, but we'll have to wait and see uh, what happens there with the, with the regulations. And finally, uh, let's see if that's finally, almost next to finally, uh, there's the mo micro business. And so this is where you get your vault. Your, your vertical integration, you know, it's, it's really intended to be for the craft producer. And, um, and so if you wanna stay small and focused, uh, then um, this is, I think, a great, a great option. And cooperatives, uh, they also actually can cultivate, produce and distribute. So they're sort of like vertically integrated, but they can't sell to the end consumer. Um, and they're democratically controlled. Only New Yorkers need apply. No cross membership. Oh, okay, before we go, a question from an attendee. Will delivery be receiving their product from cultivators, processors, or dispensaries? Delivery, uh, deliveries will be receiving their product from distributors. Okay. Yeah, that's the way it'll work. Uh, so takeaways, strategies, choose your lane carefully. As we've talked about, there's a lot of cross ownership restrictions. So you want to think carefully about, you know, which one you want to choose. Um, and that, and, um, the next one is location, location, location. You have which jurisdiction you're going to be in. Are they, do they have opt that have they opted out? They have time, place, manner restrictions. Uh, and then even within the, once you find a jurisdiction, you really want to think about, well, how close am I going to be to other applicants? How close am I going to be to schools and churches? Uh, and know your neighbors, you know, are, are you going to get a lot of pushback? Because that we've seen in California is a constant uh, issue. 
And then there are equity, equity, equity. It's a huge focus of MRTA, major goal for New York. Um, and so you really want to consider whether or not uh, your company can qualify for, uh, for the, as an equity, social and economic equity applicant. Here's some things you can do now because um, license applications aren't available yet, but there's a lot you can do now. I'm going to highlight here five big ones. One is draft a business plan. Whenever Tremaine Wright is asked, how do I get started? She says, draft the business plan. <laughs> she was a small business owner herself. And it's actually a requirement, uh, as you'll see under the medical regs. You have to have a business plan as part of your application. So you might as well have one. Uh, the other is to thoughtfully form a limited liability entity, which will then be the applicant. Um, limited liability entities, uh, they do what they say for the, for the members and the shareholders. They, they help to limit your liability. Um, but I think more importantly, you know, the, it's not enough just to, to form the founding, to file the registration, to register the, the organization. You really need these documents, the, the bylaws, the operating agreement if you're an LLC, to be thoughtfully crafted because um, one of the most common dis reason, you know, disputes that arises in the cannabis industry between partners, business partners, you know, people who are in the same company can't agree in which direction the companies are going to go in, who's to, who to hire, so on and so forth, and whether or not to bring in new investors. Uh, so you want to think through some of those issues um, early on. Next is uh, assemble your team and assign roles. You know, uh, the regulators want to know that you're going to be ready, willing, and able to carry out your licensed activities. So hire people with experience. Um, and, um, and if you don't know them, conduct background checks uh, because they are um, definitely uh, important aspects. And assign compliance roles, computer community outreach directors. Uh, Research local jurisdictions and scope out the real estate. And finally, be patient. Gifting clubs, they've been popping up all over. CCB, OCM, they know about them. There is no gray area they make clear. They've made very clear. These are um, unlawful. Um, so, and they might jeopardize your ability to apply for a license once, once those applications become available. So, uh, we're kind of coming up on the hour and there's a lot more. I guess I'm just going to keep going. Let's go for it. Yeah, we, we are scheduled for 90 minutes. Great. Go for it. Okay, great. So <clears throat> let's jump into, I think that, that concludes our, our licensing uh, re recommendations and, and strategies. Let's jump into some other potential ways that people might get involved in the cannabis industry. So buying or investing in a licensed cannabis business or registered organization. Here are some of the top issues that uh, might arise that you wanna consider. License transferability, obviously we've talked about, um, even when licenses are transferable, uh, they are, you often, generally we're gonna need approval from the CCB. So that's something, to keep in mind. What are some licenses that are not transferable? Social and economic equity applicants may not transfer or sell their license within the first three years, except to another qualified social and economic equity applicant. Something to keep in mind. Uh, changes of 51% ownership in a company or 51% of the officers and directors of the company also may require CCB approval. And without it, if you, if you don't get to seek that approval, the, say the license will, will be void. So be, do, do, do uh, go about that carefully uh, if you're investing, uh, or buying a company. New York doesn't have a residency requirement for um, owners, but it does have require a certain nexus to the state. Either you've been incorporated incorporated in the state, or a majority of the members are from New York State, uh, or they have a principal office in the state. Uh, so 
this might arise and say, this issue might arise and say a merger where the New York licensee is merged into a, a foreign corporation. Like a Delaware that, Corp. Like a Delaware Corp, right? That doesn't have uh, headquarters in, in New York or a uh, majority of, of people in uh, members were new, from New York residents. Um, so it's something that, something that keep in mind because you're, you're not just an applicant the first time, you have to reapply, reapply to two year licenses. So you have to reapply. Um, again, preserving the company's social and economic equity status as we discussed the many benefits there. Uh, so if somebody is, if the company does qualify, you might wanna make sure you preserve that um, by ensuring that the um, minority, if it's a minority owned business or a woman owned business, that they are remaining in control uh, they have sufficient control of the company. And then finally, here's one that's unique to New York, which is Section 630 of the New York Business Corporations Law. Under this statute, the 10 largest shareholders of a privately held company, it could be a corporation or LLC, under certain circumstances can be liable for the unpaid wages owed to the, to the company's employees. Uh, this is... Uh, most states don't have this, but New York still does. Uh, it applies to, to closely held companies. So if you're investing in a New York licensee and they're an LLC or a corporation, you really want to first check the cap table, see if you're in, if you're among those 10 largest shareholders. Uh, and then, you know, you might want to have monitor how the, how the company's employees are being compensated. You know, keep an eye out for something like deferred compensation, because if things go south, then you might be on the hook for that compensation. Something to be aware of. Okay, here's another common one. Uh, as we know, <laughs> I love it's fun in there. I'll, I'll, I'll put it all out there so people can know what we're talking about. Uh, we all know that white labeling, co-manufacturing, uh, they're very commonplace uh, in this industry. And, and it's, great, it's a great way to capitalize on, on your IP assets. In fact, Omar just gave us a talk last week about how to build out your IP portfolio. Uh, and those slides are on our website. Um, if anybody's curious to see. So a couple of things to keep in mind though. Uh, first is, uh, as we all know, there's no federal trade, no trademarks, federal trademarks for cannabis, uh, and you can't sell it across state lines. Um, and additionally, New York has what's called a use in commerce requirement. Uh, so unlike federal law, where you can uh, file for an intent to use a trademark in the future, you actually have to be able to prove that you're using the, the trademark in commerce in New York. So. The strategy here is that if you're going to license your your trademark to uh, somebody in New York, go and get it registered as quickly as possible. Uh, once once you have that use in commerce requirement satisfied, um, once you as soon as you have those products, they're made and start off being offered, um, go register it. That will give you protection throughout the state of, of New York. Um, and then the other one is, is, a, is a caution uh, because New York, like some many, many other states has a, has a franchise sales act. Um, but the New York's definition uh, is broader. Uh, definition of franchise is broader than in many other jurisdictions. So uh, in New York, the definition of a franchise has two elements. One is either there's a trademark or a marketing plan as prescribed in substantial part by the franchisor. And the second part is that there's a franchise fee is paid. In other jurisdictions, like in California, you need both the trademark, the marketing plan, and the franchise fee. But New York only boils it down to two. So uh, you don't want to be an unintended franchisor uh, because you know, franchisees have a registration requirements. There are particular taxes that need to be paid. Uh, 
so it, it's um, something that you really want to, um, and you could open yourself up to civil and, and criminal liability if you are an unintended franchisor. There are even restrictions just for offering trademark licenses, you know, that might be to, to multiple people. Uh, so you really want to check with a, uh, a lawyer on, on, you know, look into the Franchise Sales Act and, and, and check with the lawyer before you start uh, licensing your trademark into, into California or into New York. Sorry. The other one uh, that I want to talk about is trade secrets. So um, let's say, you know, you want to license your secret special edibles recipe or your uh, super duper flower genetics uh, to New York processors or growers. Most likely these are going to be protected by uh, trade secrets. First thing that you need to know is um, genetics are generally transferred through seeds, uh, which are considered part of the cannabis plant under federal law. And so they're not legally, you can't legally transport them across state lines. Um, that's the first caution. The other uh, one. I be a workaround. I mean, I guess, you know, uh, there's people that, who can get tissue cultures from the stock of the plant and the mature stock of the cannabis plant is excluded from the federal definition of marijuana. Ah, that's a great, great idea. There's a strategy. Uh, that's an awesome strategy. I love that. Um, Good. So then, so then the other one has to do with uh, <clears throat> New York's trade law, uh, trade secret law, which is unique and different than most other states. Almost every other state has adopted the Uniform Trade Secret uh, Act, not New York, and I think not Massachusetts. Um, so New York has uh, the six-factor balancing test to determine whether or not the, uh, a trade secret exists. And it also has what's called this continuing use requirement, mm. uh, which says that um, a trade secret must be a process or a device for continuous use in the operation of the business. How, how might that come into play if say you're licensing a uh, recipe that's only used you know, by the processor a few times a year? Hmm. something to consider uh, so recipe yeah i think the solution would probably not be licensing under new york law but invoke the federal defend trade secrets act because it has a much broader and inclusive definition of trade secrets and so you know it, that's a really good point that you bring up the limitations of new york trade secrets law and how narrow the definition is compared to the federal definition yeah, that's a great that's a great point. And that federal law just came out in 2016. It's relatively new. Yeah. Uh, and and it was sort of intended for, well, in, in any case, I think that's a great that's a great point. What I was going to suggest is, you know, with any trade secret, uh, you want to have a trade secret protection plan, which details your policies and your procedures for anybody who's touching that trade secret, who has knowledge of it and might come into contact with it in terms of keeping it secret. That's a key point. Uh, part of being a trade secret, mm -hmm. even, in, even in New York. Uh, but I think you would also want to sort of document how you'd meet this six factor test here. Absolutely. Uh, and, and how you're, how it, it meets the continuous use uh, process if you're licensing into New York. So make it New York specific as, as well. Mm -hmm. But I like the um, federal, federal um, angle as well. Yeah, and there's been federal litigation where you would have thought the federal court would thrown out the federal trade secrets dispute because it violates federal law somehow, and that, that has not happened in the federal litigation that has taken place. And so, oh, wow. you know, people have been able to assert that federal defend trade secrets act successfully in federal court, which I think is what makes it a viable strategy for building an IP portfolio. Great to know. I love it. Definitely valuable. All right. So the next category is selling services to licensed businesses. So say um, you're a security consultant 
or an environmental consultant, or uh, you want to be a head cultivator, but not an employee for, uh, for a particular farm grower. Um, one, the first thing you want to consider is whether or not you meet the, the, if you're not intending to be an employee and you want to be an independent contractor, you have to really structure your agreements carefully, structure your, um, the scope of your work uh, very carefully. And so I uh, definitely recommend talking to an employment lawyer before going out and just um, offering your services to, uh, to, to licensees. The other one uh, that I'll point out, and you know, this is in the MRTA under the medical uh, cannabis laws for registered organizations, but I suspect it might also apply to, to New York, so to the adult use. Uh, so as, as you know, Omar, in California, we have this owner definition where if somebody is in uh, direction management or control over the, over the company, they can be disclosed to the regulators as an owner, and, and then it's all copacetic, right? Um, for them to really be involved hands-on in, in the company. Mm -hmm. But uh, in New York, they don't have that. Instead, what they've done in, in the, under the medical law is spe specified that uh, you know, a registered organization may contract with people to do these uh, ancillary uh, type services or functions. They can't perform any function or activity that's directly involving the activities that are licensed, you know, that are licensed, that are mm -hmm. licensed activities. So there are some examples that they give there, planting, growing, tending, harvesting, processing, packaging. Um, you know, I think that that's something to be cognizant of. Um, certainly if you're going to be contracting with a registered organization, Mm -hmm. And um, and I think that will probably a similar scheme is going to be implemented for the adult use licenses. But it's not in the actual language of MRTA, right? It's just uh, something that would probably be put into the regs for the adult use. Yeah, that's right. This is in um, this is related to register organizations right here. Mm -hmm. So I think I didn't there's no parallel restriction on adult use businesses. I didn't see it in there uh, for mm -hmm. adult use, but I mean, they're going to have to figure out some way to handle it yeah, right? because they don't have owners. They don't have that owner definition. Let's see. All right. So here's, here's a strategy uh, that um, one to consider. Um, if you want to develop your cannabis brand before you can actually get products to market, you could develop a hemp cannabinoid product line and use it to build brand recognition and, and trust. Um, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of I think cannabis companies now uh, that are developing these CBD lines mm -hmm. uh, at, because uh, they're, um, you know, at least in, in California and in New York, these CBD products are, are permitted, expressly permitted. And that's, a, that's sort of a recent development but uh, an important one where, you know, it's no longer ambiguous under California or, or New York law, whether a CBD food or, 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 or beverage uh, is, is, is lawful. So um, as you can see there, the licenses and permits are relatively cheap um, and, and New York um, allows this wide range of, of product types that um, for hemp cannabinoid products. The only thing to be aware of is uh, that there's no Delta-8 allowed for hemp cannabinoid products can't have Delta-8. Those, those products are gonna have to be sold through the adult use channels. And similarly, uh, any product that's um, intended, labeled or advertised for the purpose of smoking, any hemp flower that's, you know, or, or other product that's labeled that way, cannot be sold through retail stores. It's gonna to have to be sold through, um, through the adult use channels as well. But um, potential angle to, to get your brand out there, right? Uh, 
Yes, and register the trademarks because I think New York does allow for trademark registration, but not intent to use. So you have to be in lawful commerce. That's right. So you could have a trademark for your hemp cannabinoid product, and that might put a placeholder when your when your cannabis product becomes available. Yeah, and it's also a great way to uh, you know also distribute your product in interstate commerce since hemp is federally legal and register those federal hemp trademarks with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. 100%, 100%. You can register them federally. Um, which we highly recommend. Okay. And then our favorite topic. All right. Tourism. As mentioned, uh, Omar is on the board of the Cannabis Travel Association. Yes. Uh, so think we think a lot about uh, cannabis tourism, and and New York's going to have a ton of people. I mean, what is that? New Amsterdam becomes the old Amsterdam, uh-huh. right? We got uh, all kinds of opportunities that that are going to be blowing up here. People are going to fly into New York, uh, especially with these on-site consumption lounges. A couple of things uh, just to think about here. Uh, there's no events license. California does have an events license. Uh, MRTA does not. So if you're thinking of holding an event, uh, you know, check, you should check your local jurisdiction rules. Uh, so for example, New York City requires a temporary place of assembly certificate of operation for an event where 75 or more people gather indoors or 200 or more people gather outdoors. Mm. So, um, something to consider about, uh, about that. But what, what I'm really excited about, and you can see this headline just popped up in my feed uh, the other day, where some Cornell grads are gonna be opening a, a boutique canvas hotel. I mean, how cool is that? And, um, and in fact- And these guys are grads of like the vaunted uh, Cornell Hotel School, you know? And so, yeah, I think- uh, it's going to be amazing that in Ithaca, there's going to be this boutique cannabis hotel and it's going to be run by Cornell Hospitality Grants. I can't wait to stay there. Uh, it's going to be amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So um, just to give the, the legal background on this. So under the MRTA, you know, everybody became excited once it passed said, oh, we can smoke. We can smoke anywhere we want now. Um, in fact, there's there's laws about where, where you can and cannot smoke. There's a New York Clean Indoor Air Act, mm. uh, which does present, put smoking and vaping restrictions on uh, most places indoors, uh, places of employment, bars, food service establishments. But there are also these carve outs uh, where, where smoking is potentially uh, allowed. They didn't carve out once under the MRTA uh, they didn't include cannabis on, under most of those carve outs, but notably they did include for uh, a hotel or motel room rented to one or more guests. Hmm. Amazing. Cause uh, Colorado had a big problem with like no consumption in the hotel rooms and like people would go there and have to go in the park for the next six hours. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, it's still up to the hotel and mm-hmm. I should note, you can still you still need to know what your local jurisdiction's laws are because the local jurisdiction can pass stricter laws, but at least under the state, the uh, New York in Clean Indoor Air Act, it you know it will be a possibility, and certainly looks like people are already taking advantage of it. Um, so there's the great. I think. That's all I have for today. Uh, did we get any other questions? No, I think that's it. I guess last call for questions. Please post your questions to the chat or raise your hand if you. All right. I think that's it. Well, um, let me just give her contact information is there on, on that last page. So feel free, you know, to reach out. Ha- happy to answer any questions anybody might have. Um, keep this dialogue going. As you can tell, we're excited. It's going to be great. Great things on the, on the horizon for New York. So.
Thank you. For we have a question. Us. We have a um, question from an attendee. Can you tell us anything about national trends and state mandated training for people working in the industry? Which states have it? Is it likely that New York will require any? Hmm. I mean, I, there's no state mandated training in California for the cannabis industry. You know, there's OSHA requirements. And I guess there is requirement that um, I guess some of the licensees uh, do have like a, um, their employees completed OSHA, occupation, uh, Occupational Safety and Health Administration training. So I think it's likely that New York will require OSHA training because oc occupational health and safety is very important to the regulators pretty much across the nation. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm trying to think in New York, the only training I can think of that's mandated actually is for the registered organizations for people who are, who are employees there. There's like a two hour training course that they need to take state mandated. Um, but that's about all that I, I, I can recall under the MRTA. Okay. And then a final question. Would you touch on any pertinent labor law regarding MRTA? Pertinent labor laws? Well, you know, I think my book actually, like we try to uh, like separate, you know, the different parts of the law. But do you know any pertinent labor law right off the bat? Well, in terms of uh, employees, employee use, Mm -hmm. of cannabis there are actually are uh, very strong protections for medical patients who are mm -hmm. certified medical patients who are uh, nice. deemed to be um, you know fit under uh, the, the disability provisions of the law um, so you know a lot of it has to do with um, like re potential retaliation for, for use mm -hmm. uh, you know employee employers can develop employment policies uh, about use while on while at work and impairment at work, but they're not allowed to, uh, uh, you know, prohibit the use off off work. And of course, it, you know, if you're working for the federal government, it's going to be it's going to be a different different matter. But um, but New York MRTA does touch on that aspect of, of the employment employee um, employer relationship. Yes, I've, I found it. It's a uh, labor law section 201D, discrimination against engagement in certain activities, and it protects an individual's legal recreational activities, including cannabis in accordance with state law, outside work hours, off of the employer's premises, and without the use of the employer's equipment or other property. Um, so I think that's, that's pretty nice that it's expressly protected. We don't have that in California. There are no... Uh, labor law protections for employees, you know, and it just turns out that so many people use cannabis that any employer who were to discriminate against cannabis users would really be um, shooting themselves in the foot in a very tight labor market. Right. <laughs> Especially in this market. All right. Any final questions? Thank you, attendees, for your participation and your great questions. It's been a pleasure, and uh, I'll give Andrew the last word. Oh, I just uh, echo you. Um, thank you very much for having for for attending. And again, feel free to reach out to us uh, if you have any other questions. And uh, hope to see you again. Thank you.